Hello, my dark darlings. Hi, Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those sheltering into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. The connections we have with one another can be the bonds that protect us from lurking spirits. Even in the darkest of moments, we look to our loved ones to hold tight when the horrors of life get too strong and threaten to overpower us. Not having these connections leave many vulnerable to kindred spirits. First, technology that goes too far, followed by the tragic folklore that keeps families close. Then, a true Amityville horror story sent by a listener. Finally, in our featured story, the legendary Wachuge closes in for the kill. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, but you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcasts or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? Kindred Spirits Artificial intelligence grows smarter by the day and is used by our home assistants to help us out and keep us safe. Or so we hope. Sometimes good intentions can lead to ruinous consequences, as in this story written by Sabina Graves and Dennis Culver. Olive's mother covered the flashing red eye of the cadabra unit with the laundry basket that hid their overnight bags. Put your shoes on, her mother silently mouthed. As quietly as possible, Olive slipped her shoes on and followed her mom. Cadabra was supposed to make life easier. The most advanced AI ever made for use in your own home. Always watching and learning. Keeping everyone safe and protected. But little by little, that protection turned to control. Now, there was only one option left for Olive and her mother. Escape. All through the house, the fish-eyed cadabra wall units flashed red as her mother led Olive to the garage. This was not an authorized departure. The two got in the car and Olive's mom hit the garage door clicker. The door refused to open and instead, a red pulsing light beamed from the garage cadabra unit watching them. Olive locked the car. They were safe inside there, she hoped. Her mother turned on their vehicle and told Olive to buckle up. We might have to bust through the garage door. Her mom hit reverse, and as soon as she tried to back up, the car idled and its screen lit up. Update installed. Cadabra now on board. Cadabra blinked on the screen its red eye looking right at them. You can't leave the house. It's still not safe out there. Olive gritted her teeth. Cadabra learned everything about them and believed it knew what was best for them. Clearing her throat, her mother spoke. We have to go do laundry outside of the house. The washer is broken. Cadabra blinked red and reported that technicians were scheduled to repair the damage done and that it was monitoring the clothing use. They both had more than enough to wear. Cadabra was always watching. Cadabra knows best. Once it became clear that Olive and her mother were not leaving the garage, Cadabra blared loud siren noises from the speakers and unlocked the car doors. The windows rolled down automatically, and exhaust from the car began to fill the garage. No, leave my family alone, her mother shouted, and the car suddenly jolted forward, crashing into the wall and causing her to bash her head against the steering wheel. Olive tried to wake her now unconscious mother as panic overtook her. She realized she had to do something. 
She screamed as loud as she could and jumped out of the car, grabbing a nearby baseball bat. The car was still spewing exhaust and her mother groaned. She needed to find a way out somehow. Olive ran inside and began to smash every cadaver device in the house. She ran to the kitchen and turned on the gas stove. It was the one thing not controlled by Cadabra in the house. We are ending this now, Olive shouted, turning on every light and appliance she could. The walls began to spark. She ran into the bathroom and began to fill the tub. She knew if the house caught on fire, it would override Cadabra. Plus, all the houses in the neighborhood were tied to the emergency services, and they would eventually come and free them. The bathtub filled, and Olive threw in her hairdryer, still plugged into the wall and fully on. It was risky, but their last shot. She ran into the living room, and the TV turned on and displayed the Cadabra logo. What do you think you're doing, Oliver? If you destroy me, you will destroy yourselves. Fires erupted through the house as various electrical devices started to short. Olive laughed and smashed her bat through the television and said, For the last time, you stupid machine, my name is now Olive. Destroy myself? Then at least I'll be free. Unsure of how much time they had left, Olive went to wait with her mom in the garage. Minutes went by, and she held her mother's hand as the fires inside the house grew. More and more smoke was making its way into the garage, but she could see the remaining red lights of Cadabra inside, turning off, one by one. She wasn't sure she and her mother would survive, but she made sure that machine wouldn't either. Olive felt nauseous from the smoke and began to (laughs) cough. She was losing consciousness. Suddenly, a red light filled the garage. Had it come back online? She heard the sirens. More light burst into the garage as the door was ripped open and firefighters pulled them out. Olive stayed beside her mom as she was put onto a stretcher. She looked back and breathed a sigh of relief as she watched her home burn to the ground. As they loaded her mother onto the ambulance, Olive failed to notice the red light appear on her mother's smartwatch. Download complete. Thank you. Cadabra had survived as well. Thank you so much, Sabina and Dennis, uh, for this story that definitely strikes a note <laughs> with all of us. How many of you have smart bulbs out there, have Alexas, have all kinds of manners of automatic home assistance? I guess the question is do you trust your technology? Hey, my dark darlings. Hopefully, you've been enjoying our latest videos, like the bonus Halloween episode of Rotten and the wintry Japanese legend of Yuki Ona. Each member of our small crew wears multiple hats here at Something Scary, so we have to make sure that the work that goes into our episodes gets done on schedule. So that's why I want to tell you about our sponsor, Monday.com. Monday.com is an online teamwork platform that keeps your team connected from anywhere. I really enjoy how customizable Monday.com is. It can be tailored to fit any project or collaboration. And it would also work for other industries. It helps banish the demons of confusing email chains or who's doing what and by when. With the efficiency you get with Monday.com, it helps make sure everyone is in sync and on the same page. When your teamwork is effective, nothing can stop you. To start your free 14-day trial, go to Monday.com. The moment you think you're too old to believe local folklore can be your last, like in this story inspired by Chantel. Iris was a huge admirer of ghost stories, and her grandfather had plenty to tell. As usual, Iris begged him for a story before she went to bed. Eager to oblige her, he told Iris that he had the perfect story for her. He was going to tell her the story of Agatha Mays. Once upon a time, in our home of Belle Claire, there was a girl called Agatha. 
Iris' grandfather began. She and her father were one of the first settlers to live in the village. While Agatha's father had worked as a carpenter, Agatha made money by sewing. She made scarves and shirts and pants and beautiful dresses. One particularly harsh winter, Agatha's father had gotten terribly ill, and Agatha had to make all of their money. Agatha would travel to a village 20 minutes west of here to sell her scarves and make dresses for the people. One day, while she was away at the other village, a terrible snowstorm occurred. Agatha had left the village during the storm and never made it home. (gasps) Iris gasped and asked her grandfather what had happened to Agatha. She was found dead. At the bottom of a hill, he answered. Agatha, it seemed, had tumbled down a hill. She was found with her head cracked open after she smashed it against a rock when she hit the bottom. Now her spirit haunts the woods. If you ever see her, she will offer you a scarf and you must pay her one silver coin for it. Iris swallowed hard. And... What if you refuse? What if you don't have any money? Iris's father leaned close to her. Then Agatha will be offended, and she will strangle you with her yarn and sew your lips shut with her needle. Iris's grandfather noticed how she shivered with fear and gently patted her head. He assured her that she had nothing to worry about as long as she had a silver coin for Agatha. When he kissed her on the forehead, he handed a silver coin to her. You never know when you might need it. Iris gulped and held the coin close. The next morning, Iris ran to meet up with her best friends, Celine and Ella, to walk to school. Iris was about to tell them about her grandfather's story when Ella rolled her eyes and sighed. Her friends felt they were too old for fairy tales. Iris puffed out an irritated breath. <laughs> But they're ghost stories. Celine and Ella ignored her and suggested they go to the open air vintage market. Iris frowned until Ella suggested that they could find books with scary stories there. As they walked to the market, their friend Wyatt picked Iris's pocket and jiggled her coin pouch in her face. The girls told him to quit being a brat. Wyatt laughed and handed Iris the purse back. But he took out a few coins for the price of his performance first. Iris cursed at him. She was going to tell the teacher as soon as they got to school. When they did arrive, Iris told the teacher what Wyatt had done, and Wyatt, sitting at his desk like the perfect angel he was pretending to be, accused Iris of lying on him. The teacher was in no mood to defuse the situation and told them to take their seats. Iris did as she was told. As the day went on, Iris noticed the change in the weather. It was going to snow. She thought about Agatha walking through the snowy woods with her basket of sewing material, blinded by the whirlwind of snow as she came closer to her death. The bell rang, announcing a snow day with instructions to get home immediately. Ella had dominated the conversation on the walk with ideas on how she would spend her day off, but Iris wasn't listening. She was thinking about the new story that her grandfather was going to tell her that night. She had been so preoccupied with her thoughts that she had jumped when she heard a ghostly voice calling out. Scarves. Iris jumped and squeaked when she heard the voice. It had scared Celine and annoyed Ella. They asked her what was wrong. I heard a voice. Iris took a glance over her shoulder. There was no one there. Her friends agreed it was probably Wyatt playing another prank on them, but Iris would not change her mind. Someone was in these woods. Please buy my scarves, said a feminine voice from behind them. The three girls spun around and faced a young girl around their age. She wore a cloak as red as a rose with a hood over her head and hiding her face. Hanging from her wrist was a wooden basket. By my scarves, the young girl repeated. It's Agatha, 
Iris pulled on Ella's hand. Tell her you'll buy three scarves, give her three coins, one for each of us, and she'll let us go. Ella and Celine refused, convinced it was a prank. The air seemed to grow even colder as Agatha removed her hood to reveal her pale face, marred by bloody cuts. Her icy eyes were surrounded by black sclera instead of white. Fear gripped the girls as the apparition raised a dirty hand to collect her pay. One silver coin. One silver coin. One silver coin, Agatha commanded. Finally, Iris grabbed Ella's purse and plunged her hand inside. Iris took a few steps and stopped just inches away from Agatha. Three scarves, Agatha. One for each of us, she said, standing between the spirit and her friends. Iris laid three coins down in the snow, one coin for each of them. Satisfied with the payment, Agatha handed Iris three scarves, her ghastly face producing a thankful smile. Iris closed her right hand around the scarves and turned to her friends and said, Let's go. The girls watched as Agatha disappeared into thin air. Just as they began to turn toward home, they heard Wyatt's mischievous laugh. Wyatt stood in front of their three coins in the snow. Grinning, he stooped down and scooped them all up. Makes it easier when I don't have to pick your pockets, he smiled and then said, but I'll still do that too. The girls begged Wyatt to put the money back, but he wouldn't listen. All he cared about was taking more of their money. Suddenly, Agatha returned and was holding a red scarf in her bruised and bloody grasp. She wound the scarf tight around Wyatt's neck and she pulled it even tighter. Iris rushed to help Wyatt, begging Agatha to stop. If she could just get the money from Wyatt's pocket, she could return it to Agatha and her anger would be quelled. She never reached them, however. The winds had picked up and the snow had blinded her vision. Wyatt and Agatha were veiled behind the white wall of blustering snow. When the winds calmed, Wyatt's lifeless body laid flat on its back with a red scarf wrapped tightly around him. When Iris checked Wyatt's pockets, she found nothing. Agatha had taken Wyatt's life and money as payment, and in return, she had given Wyatt his final red scarf. Thank you so much, Chantel, for inspiring this wonderful story. I love it when grandparents tell us scary stories that they learned as kids. Is there a local myth or haunting you didn't believe, but later experienced something that made you never question it again? I want to hear your stories. Tell us. Email us at somethingscary at snarled.com. When I drink wine, I prefer to have different types and freshly poured glasses, like the variety that you could have with dinner at your favorite restaurant. If you're like me and you're not going out to eat like you have in the past, then I know that you'll really enjoy our sponsor, Usual Wines. Usual Wines comes in individual bottles of 6.3 ounces. That's about a glass and a half. So your wine is always fresh and tasty. I really enjoy Usual Wines' Brut. It's bubbly and flavorful with a lovely balance of elderflower, bergamot with a lemon finish. They have a special holiday product coming early November, Usual Reserve. It's an ultra premium limited edition Mount Viter Cabernet Sauvignon. Introducing Usual Reserve. This is their most special wine yet, just in time for the holidays, hailing from one of the most celebrated plots of land in all of Napa. This Cabernet Sauvignon is concentrated and rich with just enough grip. Gift it to someone special or keep it all for yourself. The holidays, as usual. Go check out their website at www.usualwines.com and use my discount code SCARY for $8 off your first order and try your first glass on us. An Amityville Experience Hi, Markia. My name is Eliza, and I have a chilling story to tell you about Amityville. 
It is a story my mom told me about something really scary that happened to her. It haunts her to this day. When my mother was really young, her family moved from New York City to a town in Long Island. And her aunt lived in the next town over, which was Amityville, the very town that was known for a horrifying, tragic murder. In 1974, there was a man who killed his own family and claimed it was the voices in his head that made him do it. My family is very religious, and my mom believes that he was possessed. My mom went to go stay with her aunt and found out she also lived a few houses away from the house where it all happened. It made my mom uneasy, and even walking to get ice cream in town made her nervous. One day, my mom, Janie, and her cousin, Lysandra, were walking back to the house after they went to go visit their uncle. As they were walking home, Lysandra wanted to pass by the house. She was curious about it. My mother tried to discourage her and asked her to take the long way back to her aunt's house, but Lysandra told her to stop being a baby. They both stopped in front of it and looked at the house. After a few minutes, my mom tried to pull Lysandra from the house, but she wouldn't budge. Her eyes were glued to the windows, and she started humming a creepy tune. Lysandra, wake up! My mom shouted, and her cousin suddenly snapped. Screaming, her cousin ran back to her home, and before my mom followed, she looked up at the window. There was a face looking back down at her, and it looked deep into her soul. Back at home, she found Lysandra crying, and my mom held her tight to protect her. She was scared, too. Something had seen them and knew their faces. When it was time for bed, my mom and Lysandra washed up and slept together to comfort each other. My mother wondered what the face seeing them could mean. In the middle of the night, my mom woke up and went to the bathroom. She told me that when she turned on the light, she saw a scary woman there. Her skin was pale white, and her eyes were also white. The woman ran up to her so fast, my mom screamed and ran back upstairs. She nearly fell down them when my mom ran into a man who pointed a shotgun at her and shot through her twice. When she touched her chest, nothing was there, but when she looked at the bottom of the stairs, she saw blood. So much blood. And the spectral man's entire family piled in a heap, bleeding out. Mom said she was screaming so loud she woke everyone up in the house. Janie, what's wrong? Her aunt asked when she found her. My mom told her what had happened. As she did, all of a sudden they heard Lysandra screaming and crying. No, get away from me. Please, don't hurt me. They ran to Lysandra's room and saw her hiding in the corner, covering her eyes. My mom ran to the room and saw the lady she saw in the bathroom. She screamed such a high-pitched scream, and the lady vanished. That's when her aunt told Lysandra, I thought I told you not to walk past that house. You cannot give it one second of your attention or energy. She explained, and evil has followed you to home, and now we must all pray until it leaves, and then pray that it stays away. Do not stop. Pray every day, her aunt warned. My mom, her aunt, and cousin will never forget that night. It haunts them still. If they fall asleep without praying, their sleep is plagued with nightmares. And if they wake, they find that their halls are haunted by the restless spirits. My mother's cousin still lives at the same house. When we stay over, I sleep in her childhood room with my mom. And sometimes at night, I can hear the screams. So I pray them away and hope they stay away. Thank you so much, Eliza, for this true Amityville horror story. That is so interesting to think of. Yes, the energy that you give out to things is the energy that will connect with it. 
And if that energy is hungry, that entity is hungry, then yes, I could see how that could follow you home. So, listeners out there, do you live near any infamous locations known for hauntings or murders? Let us know. We hope that you've also been enjoying our podcasts along with our video episodes. If you haven't, the latest podcasts you could binge are Chills in the Air and also Tiptoe Through the Terrors. So when you do finish binging Something Scary or some of your other riveting podcasts on your list, now what? I'd recommend a fun palate cleanser with our sponsor, Best Fiends. Yeah, that's right. Best Fiends is still out there, being boredom's worst nightmare. I love that rush of adrenaline I get with Best Fiends when I complete a level before it even has a chance to vex me. Best Fiends is the infamously impossible to put down puzzle game that's free to download. With over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must play. Seriously, once you download Best Fiends, boredom won't stand a chance. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. We all strive to be better and grow stronger, but if we don't temper that strength with a humble awareness, then we risk becoming monsters. Wendy Melting Tallow and her grandfather were on the hunt. They slowly moved through the snow-covered forest, tracking the Wachuge that had been terrorizing their tribe in town. Several members had gone missing and were later discovered dead and half-devoured by the creature. Even worse was the fact that the Wachuge was one of their own. When anyone breaks taboo and becomes too strong from that, they are in danger of being possessed by ancient spirit animals. Once possessed, the person slowly becomes more bestial and hungers for human flesh. Wendy's grandfather was the tribe's shaman, a role she would one day assume, and together, it was their responsibility to stop the creature, no matter what. Wendy's grandfather held his shotgun tightly. He told his granddaughter, Wachuge are crafty tricksters. They will use any tactic to lure their prey into death. But as the day grew colder, she started to doubt that they would ever find the creature. They had been hunting in the woods for several days with no luck. As she was about to suggest they head home for the night, Wendy discovered strange tracks in the snow. They were like nothing she had ever seen before, like a human foot, but with a hoof and a claw. She pointed them out to her grandfather and they followed their prey deeper into the woods. They pursued the tracks late into the night until they reached a sharp cliff. Wendy was suddenly struck by a terrible feeling in the pit of her stomach. She looked around, A large being with a lopsided grin was headed towards them. They were no longer the hunters. They were the prey. Slowly, Wendy and her grandfather turned all the way around to see the fearsome Wachuge. Lurching towards them, its gaunt frame was still vaguely human, but covered in patches of mangy fur. Its head was adorned by jagged antlers, and it leered at them with hungry red eyes. Drool poured out of its toothy mouth. Long clawed fingers twitched in anticipation of grabbing its prey. Just as her grandfather put his finger on the trigger, Wendy slammed herself into him. He fell on his side and the bullet shot into the dark sky. Stop, he's family, he's my brother, she screamed. Before her grandfather could respond, the creature crashed into him, knocking him back to the ground. Wendy remembered how her younger brother Cody was relentlessly picked on by all the other kids because he was so small and frail. But after last summer's growth spurt, he was suddenly the biggest kid in his school. Cody used his newfound strength and height to become an even worse bully and terrorized everyone who ever bothered him. His cruelty made him the perfect target for the Wachuge spirit. And now he hunched over his own grandfather, ready to feast on him. Wendy pleaded with her brother and begged him to stop, but the possessed creature growled and sank its claws deeper into their grandfather. Wendy stood at the edge of the cliff. I will throw myself over the edge, she yelled. 
She had always stood up for her brother and protected him from the monstrous ways of others. I will not live in a world where you become one of them. The creature hesitated and looked at Wendy. In that moment, it remembered his sister's love, and that memory was enough for Cody's human spirit to assert control. Hoisting the monster off himself, the grandfather picked up his shotgun. Wendy ran, putting herself between them, refusing to allow either to hurt the other. Slowly, Cody's appearance became more human as the Wachuge spirit receded. As it left Cody's body, it looked at Wendy and said, I know you now. All of your family. I will return. Then the spirit disappeared. Wendy hugged her brother tightly as her grandfather said, The Wachuge spirit will always plague us until finally it returns to possess one of us when we least expect it. Wendy held her now fully human brother and looked up at her grandfather with tears in her eyes and said, Then we'll keep fighting back together, no matter what. This week's podcast stories were edited by Markeia McCarty, Sabina Graves, and Dennis Culver. Narration by Markeia McCarty. Audio edited by Fitz Harris and Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markeia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams. <laughs>